Welcome to Dropping In Legends in Risk Management, the YouTube channel in which we invite people of great achievement in the field of risk management and have conversations with them about what they have learned over the course of their careers about how to be successful in risk management. Today we are pleased to welcome Gerd Gigerense. Gerd is a behavioral scientist and professor of psychology at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Berlin. He's also director of the Harding Center for Risk Literacy at the University of Potsdam. He's a fellow and honorary member of various academies of science. Gerd has been on TED Talks talking about risk literacy, risk literacy and is the author of numerous research articles and books, including Simply Rational Decision Making in the Real World, Risk Savvy, how to make good decisions, and uh, more recently, how to stay smart in a smart world. His challenge: plenty of received wisdoms. For example, the view that we should try to optim always uh, should try to optimize the outcome, and that more information is always better. Ken, it's a pleasure to uh, to have you on the show today. Yeah, um, and, and most welcome. Um, so, Gerd, you are a man on a mission uh, to make people and societies more risk literate or risk savvy, as you also put it. Uh, what does it mean to be risk savvy? How does uh, such a person behave and think? Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, the first thing uh, to realize is that there's no single tool that makes us risk savvy. That I always thought that's obvious, but it's not obvious to everyone. So, for instance, business schools uh, still often teach uh, expected utility maximization as the only tool. As I think Bayesian is the only tool. So it's like the religion, you want to have one God that tells you what to do. Uh, I'm a toolbox person. I think we need different tools like a handyman needs different tools. And to understand this, the key distinction to start is between situation of risk where you can calculate everything. So where uh, all future states of the world are known you know, and all your actions are known and all the probabilities are known. So an example is uh, if you play roulette. So nothing else can happen except a number to be between 1 and 36 and green that's it in that world uh, use probability theory and you will find out that you will lose on the long run and you don't need anything else that makes us human humans so no emotion no no heuristics uh, no intuition nothing else just calculation on the other side, most of the situations we deal with, most important situations, have degrees of uncertainty. So where probability theory doesn't give you the optimal answer. And I find this more interesting because there is relatively little research on that. And here uh, we need what has evolved in the human brain. Huh? For instance, simple heuristics that make us smart, uh, emotions, trust, and social uh, heuristics. So that's uh, a kind of overview. The distinction between risk and uncertainty is a key distinction to understand what kind of tools we need. All right. Yeah, so, so, but just to give the reader or, or listener a chance to sort of um, follow us here, if we take the recent pandemic as, a, as an example of a situation where there's lots of uncertainty, uh, some, if, if we go back to the early phase, you know, very little exists in the way of statistics or, or so what, what would a risk savvy person uh, do in that situation or how, how would you approach, I don't know, unfolding pandemic, is there a difference here that we, uh, is there a way to describe how the difference between a risk savvy person and one that, that is not? Uh, yeah. So the, uh, if you want to predict the course of uh, COVID-19, you're in a situation of uncertainty. Yeah. And you have seen 
that uh, many of the original predictions in uh, 2020 just went wrong. Right. Because we cannot know it. Hmm? Mm. And so uh, you, the first thing is a kind of modesty. What one can do is to, uh, you know, to build walls, <laughs> so behavior, to protect oneself rather than predict. Hmm? And that's been done, uh, uh, like building dikes hmm? in kinds of uh, floods uh, or in uh, at times of corona. Uh, at the very beginning, we didn't know exactly how the transition works. So washing hands, uh, wearing masks and other things are protections. Mm -hmm. And also the realization that we only later will find out where it's really going. Right. It is. It is as usually a mixture between uncertainty and risk. So uh, Corona is uh, special because what made us fear was not so much pictures, but numbers. Mm -hmm. And most of the numbers huh, were not understood right. because we still do not train people in statistical thinking. So that's one of the tools. And, and part of the reason why uh, people thought uh, that vaccination doesn't really work uh, is not because they had some weird uh, mm -hmm. theories, but because the communication by health organization or in TV, in talk shows, uh, just didn't get the numbers right and created the impression uh, that it wouldn't work. So um, <clears throat> what I try to do is to help to promote both statistical thinking that you need for understanding the risk and heuristic thinking that you need for understanding uncertainty. Right. Yeah, that, that's a, uh, always a, a mix of uh, risk and uncertainty, as you say. But, but in this case, lo lots of information were was being put out there that was of questionable. It got ide ideological very quick, and and you found yourself in a situation where even if you were applying statistical thinking, you weren't sure if you could trust the data sources, so to speak. And and. Uh, do you fall back on some safety first principle in the situation or, or you have to proceed very cautiously, right? When when yeah. you can't have a lot of faith in the in the data that, that's being put out there. True. So what's missing here is a kind of basic scientific education mm -hmm. of everyone so that one understands uncertainty. One understands, for instance, that vaccinations are not foolproof. <clears throat> Many people believe that if they get vaccinated, then they're protected, for sure. Mm. But that's uh, not the case. And one should not underestimate the degree of innumeracy in our society. And not just with ordinary people, but with everyone. So uh, the Royal Statistics Society has just uh, done a survey with members of parliament, British members of parliament, mm -hmm. and asked them three questions. One was, you throw a fair coin twice. What's the probability that it comes out twice heads? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a, a way to find the answer is there are four cases, uh, head, head, tail, tail, um, two mixtures. And one of them is there, so it's 25%. But only half of the members of the British Parliament understood that. The other thought, most of them, it's still 50%. So it's just an illustration. Uh, I work with doctors in healthcare, mm. and you cannot imagine how little that training is in understanding tests and mm. statistical thinking in general. Most doctors cannot read an article in their own field because they don't know what ed, uh, odds ratios are, what the sensitivity is, is what it was that specificity or positive predictive value, they're lost. Huh? 
And that's the normal state. It's the normal state, yeah. So so the root cause of the lack of risk savviness, if you will, is is our that we're by nature poor at probabilities. No, no we are not poor at the probability. We just don't learn it in school. So it's a, a training issue, basically, that but it's yeah, a fixable so, problem. So just uh, <clears throat> think the 200 years back, uh, mm. before uh, people were allowed to go to school, mm. and women uh, even later. And then uh, pe some people thought that only we, uh, the educated, can read and write, huh? and the rest of the society is by nature not built. They're just uh, of a different quality. Huh? And then we have general education, and you find out, surprisingly, everyone can read and write. And we are not as far now with statistical thinking. There are still people who think that, that um, there are still researchers who think that ordinary people wouldn't be able. That because there's something uh, all kind of very strange theories. There's a system one or so who gets things wrong, and, and uh, which are somehow built in in us. The moment we educate uh, and also uh, use the research about uh, how the psychological brain is going, mm -hmm. so give, uh, uh, for instance, students good representations like frequencies rather than abstract probabilities, they can do that. We've shown, we've just studied a, a, a paper uh, that shows that already fourth graders can do base. Fourth grade, most fourth graders can do this without any training. Right. You just provide the information and icons. Mm -hmm. And that confronts with the claims that even Stanford students couldn't do that. Of course, they can do this because A, they have no training. B, they get a representation that you have to learn, you know, conditional probabilities. So uh, the, the entire story that uh, people are uh, somehow built to be stupid huh, is not true. It's, it's a kind of political story. Interesting, yeah. So, so there's uh, the, there's hope then that, that uh, let's say I'm the manager of, a, of an organization and, and I feel that my employees are not as risk savvy as I, I would like them to be, then <clears throat> I can provide workshop, let's say, in, in statistical yeah. uh, principles and, and some psychological training and, and we would be on a way towards, you know, fixing the problem. Yeah. Is that your message? Yeah, but you need to be very careful mm, to it, uh, not just teach uh, statistical thinking as a mathematical discipline. That doesn't work. Yeah. You need to teach it with the content. Uh, for instance, I, I teach, I've teach, taught more than a thousand doctors in their continuing medical education. Mm. Uh, so how to, how to get risk literate, but always on the problem. So for instance, All right. uh, uh, I have a, I'll give you an example. So the um, so many many doctors don't know the difference between a relative and absolute risk. This is something very elementary. So it's being said that uh, women who participate in mammography screening reduce the chance that they get um, <clears throat> that they die from breast cancer by twenty percent. Mm. So many people think, oh. Out of 100, uh, 20 uh, fewer die. Huh? No, it's a trick. It's made to make something small big. Huh? So uh, the way to understand that is uh, the studies show that out of 1,000 women who don't participate in screening, age 50, 10 years later, about five die. And out of 1,000 who participate in screening, it's four. So it's from four to from five to four in thousand, yeah? and the absolute risk decreases one in thousand, but mm -hmm. relative it's twenty percent from five to four. So that's right. Great. What helps is just this one simple distinction: relative risk always a big make you feel uh, 
uh, you think it's a great uh, effect and you're being tricked in, you don't understand what's there. So that, that's a way one can uh, teach that. And it's a different way than trying to nudge people, mm. say, into screening. Nudging means you don't help people to understand what's going on. You just decide yourself it's better for women to go mammography screening and then find some way to nudge them by telling them that uh, so and so for many of the others also go and in this way. Right. That's not my vision of a democracy. That's not my vision about people. We need to make people strong so they can decide themselves rather than um, guiding them like sheep. Yeah. This is an interesting point because if you if you look at society as a whole, uh, you find that a lot of times or instances where I would have used my risk seven is somebody has already done it for me. Uh, you know, we have the belts on in our cars and, and uh, children put their helmets on when they ride the bicycle and hardly anyone smokes anymore. These are decisions that have already been made for me by someone. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So it seems like the society is is uh, sort of trying to, I don't, I, I don't know if you would call it nudge, but they're trying trying to take risk out of the equation for us. Yeah. Seatbelt is not a nudge; it's a law. Hmm? Nudges are um, uh, are defined that they don't prevent you from doing something, hmm? mm -hmm. but they steer you somewhere hmm? by exploiting your own cognitive biases. In the case of that we just had mammography screening. So uh, the assumption is that women will not understand the difference between relative and absolute risk. So we don't tell them that the effect is from five to four in thousand, so one in thousand, we tell them 20% reduction, often rounded up to 30%. Mm -hmm. That's a nudge. That's a nudge. Yeah, yeah, of course, you can modify the, the default option and things like that. So, so to um, nudge people into certain behaviors. But my, my point was rather that it seems that society makes up for my lack of risk savviness a lot of times, like because yeah. so many of these decisions are are, are the default now. And, and uh, so, so where's the risk literacy gap today, would you say? Uh, I mean, it's implied in your writing or it's actually very clear in your writing that there's a, a risk there's a gap that that we need to become need to get yeah. better at this but w in which areas uh, you know in, in which respects are we still deficient in, in risk thinking would you say so the, the uh, so the one part is statistical thinking mm -hmm. uh, and uh, very few people even know what it means if you uh, the weather report says there's a 30 percent chance of rain tomorrow mm -hmm. what does that mean so yeah. percentage of what? So first, many people don't even ask the question. And we have done a study in many countries. So I live in Berlin. Most Berliners think a 30% chance of rain means that it will rain tomorrow in 30% of the time. Mm -hmm. It's seven to eight hours. Others think it will rain tomorrow in 30% of the region. So mm -hmm. Most likely not where I live. No? Most New Yorkers think it will rain in 30% of the days for which it has been predicted. So most likely not at all tomorrow. Mm -hmm. so, and most Spaniards think, oh, it means something different. It means that three meteorologists think it rains and seven not. So <laughs> the right. The correct answer is what the New Yorkers think. Yeah? It will rain in 30% uh, of the days where this announcement has been made. So, so one, this is just a simple example hmm, about a, a, a general state of lack of risk literacy. And uh, the moment it gets into health, it really gets dangerous. Right. Hmm. And uh, on the other hand, what's also what you also need is tools to deal with uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's in particular in management. Uh, this is the typical situation where you can calculate a few things, but others you can't calculate. And then mm -hmm. you need good heuristics. Mm -hmm. and that's what happens anyhow 
in uh, these areas. But uh, the, uh, I mean, the standard uh, theory of decision making is far behind. They still deal with uh, choices between gambles, monetary games, where everything is certain and mm -hmm. where the researcher knows the right answer, if there is one. Right. Yeah, so so you would like to uh, up, upgrade or change the curriculum here that, 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 that you know, we teach our <coughs> Yeah, young uh, primarily, uh, and and they are growing up, of course, in a, in a digital world. I mean, how does all uh, this apply to? Uh, would you say the the um, all the online? You know, we've moved uh, online. Basically, our, our lives are spent on the internet and and various yeah. apps these days. Mm -hmm. um, so, and and I know your most recent book is is uh, brings this uh, topic up. Uh, how are we to be become risk literate in in this new environment? Is the, yeah. what are the dangers <laughs> out there? Oh, it is <laughs> it is even more important. So I give you a few facts. Many people think that digital natives would understand, huh? but the problem is that studies show that about 90% of digital natives worldwide mm -hmm. do not know how to tell facts from fake news. Studies in uh, California and Stanford University with over 3000 digital natives asked them, uh, can you tell whether a, a website mm, is trustworthy or not? And Few know the technology, so how do the heuristics, what to do in order to find out. So uh, I give you two examples. Most uh, in this study read a text, a website that should, they should add, evaluate who is behind that. Do you want to treat me? Huh? Do, you, do they want to make my money or uh, nudge me politically somewhere? So they read it from, from top to the end, as one read in the uh, Times of Box. Hmm? Uh, what, what was needed is lateral reading. That means hmm? you just read a, a little bit to get an idea of what it is. And then you go into, say, about us and out of the site into the internet and try to find out about who is behind that. That's called lateral reading. And only if you have found out hmm, that maybe there is a PR agency that wants to uh, convince you that minimum wage is a bad idea, hmm, then you read the rest and you read it with open eyes. So um, in, in the Stanford study, 97% uh, of digital natives did not know how to find out. And that's heuristics. So it's a heuristic, heuristic lateral reading. Huh? So it's, it tells you what to do. Hmm? So if, you, if something is important and you want to figure out whether you can trust it, don't read it. For, just read a little bit, move out, find out about it, and only then read the rest. Another simple heuristic is, uh, Click restraint. Mm. Don't click at the first entry. Right. And believe that it's the most popular or the most relevant. It is most likely not. It's the one where Google or whatever search machine believes it can make most money. Exactly. Still about 50% click on the first entries without reading the snippets. So read the snippets and maybe going to the second or third page. Mm -hmm. The moment you you uh, start with the wrong foot, uh, it leads you in the wrong direction. It's hard to get back. Right. Yeah, I know exactly what you, you're talking about there. And, and this is, uh, of course, um, you know, uh, but there's some information uh, war going on and and uh, people or some some say we're even post-truth that that 
yeah. you know, so much is driven by agendas and, and usually by uh, commercial interests, etc. So, and, and this is rampant on, on the internet, obviously. So, so how are we to protect our children? I mean, uh, I mean, they grow up in this environment and, and it's so easy to believe something when it's being said to you very confidently and very professionally yeah. looking. So there are all sorts of dangers here for, for, for the young. How do you see a fix to this problem? I mean, um, cu curriculums are not being changed as quickly as you would like them, right, today. Are, are we doing enough to protect? No, the, the problem is that uh, first, uh, as you say, one source could be schools. Mm. But in many countries, governments spend money on technology, on buying tablets and whiteboards for schools, but not on mm. teaching the young people smart heuristics. Mm. So uh, tools, huh? so they can be protected, they can find out whether they're being misled. So that would be one, one easy thing to do. But here you need politicians huh? mm. who have uh, some kind of vision rather than uh, are serving the industry mm. to sell more tablets. Right. By the way, uh, and one can look at evidence at the political side. So the, the uh, studies uh, suggest that whiteboards and two digital tools for teachers are highly effective for the grades of the students. So they're positive, but the tablets are not. Tablets or not? And, and uh, so with school with, with tablets, typically you find um, uh, lower performance. And you can't think why. Yeah? What do students do on the tablets? Mm -hmm. and so uh, that's one way that you look more at the evidence rather than throwing money at schools. And the, the second way is uh, by young people themselves and parents and tools. So to, to develop a much um, um, more perspective, I want to get the remote control of my life, of my emotions back in my own hands. I'm not letting Google do it. I'm not letting Instagram do it. I'm, I'm, not, I'm also not letting all my friends determine that I should be on the alert all the time to see their last uh, photos of what they just ate. <clears throat> and so uh, a more a try for independence. I have seen a number of young people who have quit uh, social media because they felt uh, they're no longer uh, their own master and they got it back. Or you can do it in at your own measure. You may be on social media at certain points of your day, but not elsewhere. And um, so there are quite a number of ways to get the risk savvy in the digital world. Yeah. No, certainly, and and uh, but 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 it's a matter of seeing the dangers. I mean, uh, some sometimes I wonder if we as parents fully understand. Uh, how dangerous it can be out there. If you look at the suicide rates and the depression yeah. rates among yeah. uh, young young women, you know they are those curves are are horrific. Uh, maybe most parents are not even aware that that they're you know this is what what's yeah. happening to their children mm -hmm. now. Uh, so so how can we reach them or or uh, you know make this problem visible? I mean, uh, the uh, it is true that many parents are not aware, but look. Um, the ordinary person spends uh, hours every day to watch TV mm. or to watch soccer <clears throat> games. And if there's something more important to you than these, uh, like your children, you could inform yourself. And uh, for instance, books like the one I wrote yeah, and other books can help you to get informed. And uh, second, uh, none of this is really new. So uh, young people have been always seduced by others. Huh? Others who try to, uh, yeah, to get the money out of them. Hmm? And, and it's the more a reason to do something to make young people strong rather than telling them 
you shouldn't do this and so on. And they can be helped if they realize how they're being misled. And uh, and the, the victim of all kinds of things. And as you mentioned, the uh, social comparison in young women is nothing new. That has been always the case that one was looking where the other one is more pretty, has more money and other things. But the, the key difference is that it's now uh, 24 hours a day. Right. That's the key problem. So you cannot relax anymore. And, uh, and here, um, a mixture between self-discipline so digital self-discipline yeah, that one can learn uh, is necessary. And uh, the alternative is, uh, if you're not able to develop this self-discipline and say, stop, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll shut down my handy mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'll do now something different, then the, uh, the alternative will be that and, and finally, uh, governments may take over, as is happening in China. Yeah. So, so Chinese uh, young people have now a quota where they can watch, where they cannot watch. Mm -hmm. If you want that, that's, that's called paternalism, mm -hmm. that someone else decides about you, that's also an option. That is an option. Yeah, yeah, because uh, you've also uh, made the point that, you know, democratic the democracy itself is uh, potentially at stake here, you know, and, and that risk savvy citizens are, you know, important to, to maintain a healthy democracy. I mean, obviously, China do not care about uh, that particular aspect. But uh, do you see that we're on a path, you know, on a path to, to, to where, you know, democratic values are, are uh, less you know, protected or, or, or uh, yeah. what's the sort of um, picture you see here? So um, it is true that uh, digital media are ideal instruments for autocratic governments. Yeah. China is just one example. And the, <clears throat> the uh, Chinese government is developing a social credit system where everyone has a credit score. Mm. So in the in the West, every one of us has a uh, financial credit score. Mm. In the US, a FICO score. In Germany, a Schufa score, for instance, and um, where uh, your credit worthiness is being assessed. So when you buy something on the internet, mm, and while you go through the stages to pay, mm, your credit uh, uh, value score is being checked without you noticing. Mm -hmm. And the options you see at the end depend on your credit score. Mm -hmm. So the option to pay after you got something mm, may not even occur mm, because of your low credit score. So that's what's happening in the, in the West. In China, uh, it's a social credit score that uh, gets everything that's been known about you and lots about the digital uh, world together into one score. As if you enter search terms like Tiananmen Square, your score goes down. Huh? If you visit your old parents, your score goes up. Everyone is surveilled. Huh? If you cross the street at a red light, score going down and so on. And uh, people with high score get uh, bonuses, for instance, they get their mm -hmm. treat first in a hospital, and those with low score have to wait. Mm -hmm. And people with low scores uh, get maluses, they're punished. So uh, in the last years, 10,000 of Chinese citizens were not allowed to purchase a ticket for a plane mm -hmm. because they had low scores. So that's one future hmm, of us. That's a world where you give away or the government takes away all the responsibility that you have mm -hmm. and scores you. And then uh, you are punished or you get benefits. Mm -hmm. That's B.F. Skinner, the psychologist, yeah, mm -hmm. who 
use this type of operant conditioning method, mm. he might be delighted to see that this is now done, although the Chinese use more punishment than Skinner believed in. So uh, the problem is in the West, if we hear about the Chinese system, most people are appalled. Mm. But when, uh, when they are looking what we are doing, it's not so far away. We give away our data mm. just for the convenience not to pay for Google or Instagram. We, we rate Uber drivers and the Uber drivers rate us. It's already happening. Right. We rate restaurants and the restaurants have no choice than to pay to buy fake stars because everyone else does it. <laughs> So there's a market for stars now. Yeah, and the, so it's already happening, this kind of channel scoring, and, and we don't even want to notice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's an extreme example, of course, China, where, where you have this heavy handed uh, paternalism. But on the other hand, you know, in, in our societies, you know, it, it's all rampant, right? Like children will not pace themselves, their usage of, of uh, digital sources, right? And and parents can't do it for them either. I mean, they don't have the authority, it seems, to bring about change in their behaviors. So we're, we're running this massive experiment, right, where, where the risks are not fully understood. So you, should, so you might want something like what China is doing, some kind of regulation or, or uh, what's the way forward, you think, to... to uh, uh, China is one way uh, our future could be. It's the way where citizens are no longer are no longer allowed to take over the responsibility on the belief that they are yeah not risk savvy really, mm -hmm. and so that's uh, and it's a society that functions according to many measures quite well. Yeah. So the the men's the, well, there's no ways to spend all this time about democratic parties fighting with one another, mm -hmm. and. And also, uh, as far as we know, in autocratic systems, um, the uh, people have more trust in their government than in, uh, in, in, in many democratic systems. Mm -hmm. it, I'm saying this because it's not my vision. I wouldn't want to live in, uh, uh, in a country where others decide what I can say and what I cannot say. Mm -hmm or punish me. But in order to have a functioning democracy in a digital world, we need risk savvy people. Yeah, that is people who take the time and take the pains to understand what's going on. Mm. And who are willing, for instance, to pay for the data. Right. Sorry, to pay for access hmm, rather with money and rather than with data. Mm. So the, uh, there's a privacy paradox. Mm. For instance, I've done a, a survey, a representative survey in Germany, and asked um, the uh, people, what is your greatest concern in uh, the uh, digital world? And the greatest concerns of Germans was that the data is being sent by Google, Facebook, and many others, huh? to third parties, and they don't know what they're doing with that, hmm? yeah. and so on. So, privacy, hmm? greatest concern. And then I asked the same people, so assume that uh, you could pay for your, for the services, mm -hmm. and uh, you could pay for all social media, so that they no longer uh, try to find out whether you're pregnant, whether you're sick, you know, whether you're unhappy, in order to uh, send, uh, allow advertisers to send you targeted uh, advertisements. So that you could keep your data. How much would be would you willing to pay every month? So hmm? for Netflix, you may pay something between. 10 and 20 euros, yeah. depending on the service. For a coffee, you may pay three euros. 
So how much would you be willing to pay for your privacy? And when I saw the results, I was stunned. 75% of Germans across all ages are not willing to pay a single euro for their privacy. 75% are the same people who say it's my greatest concerns. That's called the privacy paradox. So if you live in a society where people complain about something but not willing to pay for it, yeah, then we have a problem. And we are going sleepwalking into surveillance. I have done a calculation. What one would have to pay? So you might think about maybe it is one cannot afford that. So uh, if you take Meta or, or known as Facebook, the entire concern who has all kind of uh, <clears throat> social media sources and take the entire revenues. Mm -hmm. And now you can do a simple calculation to find out how much would every user have to pay per month so that Zuckerberg can have as much money as he has. The answer is about two euros per month. That would it be. So it's, it can be done, but it won't be done until we have governments who step in and find a way that this system pay with your data is being stopped. That's the moment you pay with your money, then uh, the uh, Facebook and others don't need to run experiments to find out how we can keep you on the site as long as possible in order to show you as much advertisement as possible. So we all the personal like, data is no longer needed to be there, and all the influences, and also the algorithms that drive you away to, to misleading, to non-scientific, to fake news are no longer needed. Right. Mm -hmm. So that could be could solve some of the problems. So there are solutions to this, but we all need to think about this, and young people just like they're going out on Fridays for future. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an important. And I was very happy to see this. Huh? And there could be a similar movement. Huh? We want our privacy back. We want to pay. We want to have the right to pay this two euros per mm -hmm. month hmm? in order to get rid of the rest of the problems that lead to depression, that lead to uh, suicidal thoughts, that uh, lead to many other problems. Yeah, that that would certainly be a, uh, a nice change, you know. To to uh, I mean, this is feeding a lot of addictions and uh, that, that are uh, you know going to be a problem uh, at some point. So so <clears throat> that's an interesting solution you're proposing. But but Gerd, um, we also need to um, spend a little bit of time talking about heuristics and and the way to sort of navigate th this world yeah. of ours, both the real one and the digital one, and and. Uh, uh, basically, you, you're, uh, you know, again, we live in a world of uncertainty, uh, and given that, what what should we do? And um, <clears throat> your answer to that is basically to to go look for robust and useful uh, heuristics, right? Um, as opposed to some kind of optimizing behavior where we try to multiply or weigh up probabilities and, and consequences, etc. So, uh, to begin with. Uh, what is a heuristic? It's a, it's a form of rule of thumb, right? Well, could you yeah. just... It's, it's a, a, a rule of thumb that tells you what to do. For instance, lateral reading is a heuristic. That means don't read a website if you want to find out whether it's trustworthy from the beginning to the end. Mm -hmm. Go out and go something. Yeah? That's a heuristic. Yeah? And heuristics um, are useful tools while the entire idea that you could optimize, find the optimal solution in a world of uncertainty is a non-starter. It's an illusion. And, I mean, uh, take the example uh, that you could find the optimal partner for your life. Optimal means the best one right. and nothing less. 
Mm. Good luck. It's a recipe for yeah disaster. Mm. And uh, the so uh, a heuristic is what uh, most people do. They fall in love. Mm. That's all built in. Yeah? Uh, if you want to optimize, you better not fall in love. Mm. You do calculations. Mm. Right. <laughs> people fall in love and then settle down. And then create a family. If you would optimize, you would always think there might be someone better. And that's actually uh, also uh, that attitude is being reinforced by uh, online dating agencies from Tinder to those where you pay, where you put in profiles, where more and more people think that uh, maybe another swipe or so, and uh, there could be something better. There is this story uh, being told that uh, uh, a man, a, a young man, a young woman, they uh, fell in love you know, over online dating, and they're happy together. Mm -hmm. They're bed together, and he's leaving for the bathroom, and she automatically takes her smartphone uh, opens Tinder and swipes, looking for men. And he's wondering why she's doing that. But that's so easy and so convenient. Huh? You see the problem. Yeah, maybe the yeah. optimal man is just one swipe away. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. And if she had it, she wouldn't know. Mm. It would still go on. Yeah. So technology uh, drives our psychology. And we need to be aware about that. And sometimes it's good. And sometimes we really don't like it. But we need to get strong and then act and say, no. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, yeah. So, so instead of that, you, you're, uh, these heuristics, they, they solve the problem by, by you know, we, we go for good enough, rather. And, and uh, Yes, uh, but, and this whole idea is less is more in a way that that you know it's the Occam razor, Occam's razor in a way that that by simplifying in, and reducing the number of dimensions, it's not only more elegant, mm -hmm. but it's also more likely to be correct to be a good decision. That that's the yeah. interesting aspect here that that we improve decision making this way. What, what's the um, how does that work? Why? Uh, and, and what's the evidence to back that up, so to speak? It's an empirical yeah. question, uh, so, I guess, but yeah. So in an uncertain world, huh, uh, trying to make complex models, so to, to figure everything in, uh, leads to what in statistics is called overfitting. So that means you, you try to, uh, calibrate your model on the past. That's always what it is. And you assume that the future is just like the past, and that's an error, because in an uncertain world. So if you have a stable world, then you should make complex, think in a complex way, make complex models. And that's where AI really superior to human intelligence. So chess, Go. These are totally stable world. Nothing new can ever happen. The rules are set for once and ever. And here, human intelligence cannot yeah, keep up with, say, alpha zero. Mm -hmm. But human intelligence evolved not for a world that is absolutely stable, because that's not our world. Mm -hmm. And also not a world of risk that's not there, but a world of uncertainty. Mm. That's why we have emotions. That's why we trust. Huh? Mm. And the questions are different, whom to trust. Huh? Mm. That's why we have heuristics. Because if the future is not like the past, you need to simple, mm. make it simpler, not to, to fine tune on the past, because that will not work. Mm. So, to the, give, give you an, uh, an extreme example that relates to the current pandemic. So remember uh, that Google engineers tried to predict the flu 
that was for eight years between about 2008 and 2015. So, uh, for instance, to predict uh, what uh, is the flu-related uh, proportion of doctor visits next week. That's a useful thing to, have to see how the flu spreads. Hmm? And that was marketed as the great success of big data. Mm -hmm. Now think for a moment. Big data works in a stable world if the future is like the past. But viruses mutate. Mm -hmm. They come and go and change. And also the idea to use uh, users' uh, search words to infer whether they are uh, have symptoms is uncertain because many put in, for instance, when this swine flu came, uh, searches because they were curious. Yeah. So, and then as an end, it didn't work very well. Now, the alternative is we have used a very simple heuristic that is that people use if things in the past are different from the future, uh, which is recency. You only look at the most recent data and forget all the rest. You yeah. use less information. Mm -hmm. And we have used a, an extreme simple heuristic. We used only the most recent data point and ignored mm -hmm. everything else. That means the heuristic was just look at the uh, doctor related flu visits mm -hmm. a week in the latest data and predict it's the same in a week. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that simple heuristic. Uh, the uh, outperformed the mm -hmm. Google flu trends algorithm mm -hmm. over the entire eight years, and also all the old uh, the, the adjustments have been made in changing the algorithms, and the error was uh, halved. So here we have an example that shows you if the world is unstable, mm -hmm. relying on big data is dangerous because you overfit. Mm -hmm. So you need to find a simple heuristic. In this case, one data point is better than big data. So that's an yeah. example. Hmm? Yeah, that's and a very sobering. Many uh, people in machine learning have not yet realized, although machine learning people usually understand uh, the idea very clearly, there is no optimal way mm -hmm. in the real world. That's only an illusion of right. some uh, social scientists. Right. Yeah. Interesting. But 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 okay. So this particular heuristic uh, worked better, performed better than than big data in this particular case. But but uh, in most other cases, aren't heuristics also evolving from practice, uh, like yeah. which is you know based on past observations, so that they are you know basically um, fitted to some kind of observations as well. Uh, right. Right, I give you an example. So, um, a, a situation of uncertainty is if you want to hire an employee. Mm -hmm. So, that's uh, or, yeah. And um, one idea is to search for as much information as possible as the person, as you can get. Mm -hmm. Or you have an assessment center, or you uh, uh, distribute tons of questionnaires. Another uh, that's not the way of uh, simple heuristic. Another way is you need persons who have lots of experience about the kind of business where they are in and what they need. And then study what they're doing. And analyze that. And what you find is typically heuristics and often extremely simple ones. I'll give you two examples. Uh, we have uh, just published an article uh, in an annual review uh, uh, called Smart Heuristics for Teams, Individuals and Organizations. And we begin with how Elon Musk, the Tesla uh, CEO, uh, hired people when he still was hiring. So when Tesla was a small company. And Musk says he was looking only at one variable which was, has the person an exceptional ability? If not, not hired. Mm -hmm. 
That's it. So he was reasoning, if someone has an exceptional ability, uh, then the person will have show similar exceptional ability uh, after being hired. I remember when I was a professor at the University of Chicago and we hired student helpers, mm -hmm. we were hiring students of music because they typically had exceptional abilities. Right. Being able to play. Yeah? And it came with lots of other things like having stamina, hmm? uh, being able to sweat, hmm? to keep on, to go on, to be exactly reliable. So that's a heuristic. Hmm? So just go with one reason. Uh, Jeff Bezos reports about his own hiring practices. Mm -hmm. He was looking at the same queue. Go for people with exceptional abilities, but that wasn't enough for him. So his way, we modeled his way about making decisions, which is a, called a, which we call a fast and frugal tree that asked only three questions. The first one, exceptional ability, no no higher. Otherwise, we ask, he is asking another question, okay. namely, would I admire this person? Which is an interesting question. Mm -hmm. The Bezos was thinking, basically, if I admire a person, I can learn something from that. Mm -hmm. And hiring is not just about the person, it's also about me. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah? um, if no, end. Huh? Mm -hmm. And the uh, third question he was asking is, will the person uh, improve the average level of competence in the uh, section he or she is, if three years being hired. So these are examples for heuristics. A heuristic is a rule that tells you what to do, and you understand it, and you can change it and improve it. Yes, and it makes a lot of sense that, that you can f identify traits or a single trait even that, that correlates with the desired outcome. You know, through yeah. through uh, observation and experience, you, you make this sort of um, mental connection and it works and, and that's all you need to know. Um, <clears throat> and and it, it's also clear that, you know, you have plenty of evidence in your in your books that uh, this is a description of actual decision making. This is how people actually do make decisions. But uh, the more important question is, of course, how should we be making decisions? And 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 again, you know, there there are environments in which it seems, you know, makes a lot of sense that, that to use heuristics. Like if you're a firefighter, I, I wouldn't argue for a second, you know, that that you know, you just go by that. You know, it, it evidently works. But in, in more complex situations, uh, let's say an investment decision, if you're drilling for oil in the Mexican Gulf and you need to tankers to ship the, the oil up to the refineries on the East Coast, and the consequences of a failure would be enormous, right? Um, in this kind of situation, wouldn't you tend towards analytics and, and you know get a proper risk assessment, like okay. have some smart people sit down and actually think about yeah. You know, consequences and probabilities, and, and um, are there different domains where it works? The, the, the key problem is the opposition between heuristics and optimizing. Yeah? There is no opposition. It's always a going back and forth, like, just like intuition and analysis in the real world. Yeah? Yeah. The opposition is made up by researchers in decision making yeah? who think that Analysis or expected utility maximization is always right, and heuristics always wrong, wrong, and uh, not always sometimes wrong. And you better, if it's important decisions, you better do only analysis. Right. That's that's uh, uh, if you read Gary Klein's wonderful book, uh, Sources of Power, you mm -hmm. learn it's the opposite. Important decisions uh, need lots of domain knowledge, good intuitions. None of this is uh, figures in a typical decision theory, which is just abstract um, and about consistency. And, and in, in uh, uh, decisions like the one you have, the, there will be a going back, back and forth between looking at data, 
and the intuition of an experienced person there. Hmm? And finding heuristics what to do will at the end the solution. The idea that you sit there and and try to maximize to list all options and then to calculate the one with the highest probability that is not observed in the real world and not possible. It's a fiction. And we need to get rid of fictions and of fake news. And we can learn something from firefighters, from people, from doctors, from uh, how uh, people make decisions and try to understand it. And there is also a social context. Uh, so um, the term that I use for the normative question, should we, what heuristic should we use? Hmm? Uh, is ecological rationality. It's not logical rationality. It's not about consistency. It's about assessing whether a certain uh, type of uh, heuristic will work in the environment. So the most general assessment is, is it a situation of uncertainty? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, as, at least it's not expected utility maximization of Bayesianism mm -hmm. that helps you here. And, and the, the uh, heuristics I mentioned before, like one good reason or a fast and frugal trees, they are ecologically rational. That means they are likely to succeed in worlds where you have powerful cues, mm -hmm. like the, the uh, exception ability, which just carry along lots of other things hmm? where you can understand you just need to find out what the powerful cue is and go with it. Hmm? Yeah. And uh, the example with Jeff Bezos was he is more cautious. He has one powerful, but it's not enough. You need two more. Hmm? So we can build on that. Hmm? We, uh, and the uh, study of ecological rationale has a whole mathematical part, which I'm not talking here about. You can prove, for instance, that if you have a powerful cube uh, where the, which has more than all the uh, other rests, the exceptional, the, the additional uh, contribution of the others, you can mathematically prove that relying on one cube mm -hmm. is at least as good as a multiple regression and often better. And we've shown that. But all this contradicts the wisdom of standard decision theory, also of those who criticize it, like Kahneman and Tversky, mm -hmm. and but still think it's the best thing to do, it's only people. So they put the blame on people, use of heuristic, that's, uh, that's misleading. Under uncertainty, we need to judge whether, uh, say, a so-called rational system like a regressionism is actually better than relying on one reason. And the example with Google flu trends showed you how we, when we check, we find, no, it's an illusion. And we need to get rid of these illusions. They're still being taught. Managers are taught in order to make a rational decision making, you need to do uh, look at all the options and all the consequences and estimate the probabilities and calculate the best. Right? Have you ever seen a manager who does this under uncertainty? No, only beginners would try to do this. Right. Mm -hmm. And the, the challenge is much deeper than just doing this calculation. The challenge is explore the adaptive toolbox mm -hmm. and find out when, what heuristics work in what class of situations or their ecological rationality. And then we can have better decisions for hiring people better decision for predicting the flu, better decisions in medical decision making. Right. But we need to get rid of the idea, more is always better. Mm. Interesting, yeah. And and uh, so you to know when heuristics apply, you, one, one thing to look for are these powerful cues you're saying. The, the more powerful the cue, the more faith you can have in, in but, but it's not a, a black and white here. You you, you could have uh, analysis. We, we don't throw analysis out. It's a sort of a 
always going to be some mix no. uh, no. of the two, right? But again, the greatest misconception is mm -hmm. to put analysis against heuristics. Exactly. Yeah. Or against intuition. That's the absolute misconception. It's I'm I'm sorry to say this, but I'm, I'm when I read about system one against system two, that's an opposition. Eh? This is represents this misconception. Mm. If you ever have worked with decision makers in the real world, eh? one is going back and forth. A study with 70 Nobel laureates showed that they uh, attribute their success, their inventions, to going back and forth between intuition and analysis, back and forth. And thing. this is what is, it's not an opposition. Mm. It's not like in the, uh, 150 years ago, the opposition was between female intuition and male reason. Yeah. Mm? Mm. We still live in that oppositions. Mm. So the, the idea is to analyze so how one can do with uh, statistical thinking, yeah, but it's not sufficient. Yeah? Good heuristics and going back and search, but not endless search, right. but heuristic search, how one, how one can make good decisions. And that's more challenging and more difficult than just saying, yeah, I calculate my expected utility. Right. But in, a, in an organization, to come back to, to this, uh, you know, the, the business uh, setting here, um, one thing you mentioned in, your, in one of your books is that uh, people don't trust their own intuitions and heuristics uh, and they, they're not willing to stand up for them. Like, whose, whose intuition and whose heuristic would, would count? I mean, when you operate in a team environment and, yeah. and uh, you have, uh, how is this supposed to look? Aren't, aren't you chasing some kind of wisdom of the group as well, where where you want lots of different perspectives, right? And, and angles and conversations. And, and then is there a, you know, are we supposed to arrive at, at some kind of heuristic or, or that is representative for the organization here? Or, or how do you envision this? Now, that's already made, for instance, the majority of rule is a heuristic. Mm -hmm. So after the deliberation, you go with the, uh, you make a vote and go with the majority. Yeah? <coughs> uh, the majority rule is a heuristic of the type where you do not weigh, everyone is equal. Mm -hmm. And that may be a good idea in some situations, maybe a bad one in others. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So that's the ecological rationality. No rule is good by itself or bad. Mm -hmm. It's always one of ecological rationality. So we had before these examples where we have a powerful cube, a dominant cube, like in Bezos or mm -hmm. uh, in, in Musk heuristic. The, that's the one idea. At the other end, if things are equal, cues or people, you need different ones. You need heuristic of the type, uh, you do not weigh. Mm -hmm. You treat everyone equal. And that has also lots to do with fairness. So the question is always, um, and that remains for groups as well as for individuals. So, uh, is that a good rule? And one way to, to start is to observe what experienced and successful decision makers are doing. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. And to take it serious rather than to be high nosed and claim that they're all uh, making errors. Right. No, but it seems like a, an excellent uh, model, you know, to tap into the wisdom and, and resources of uh, multiple people and, and go by some consensus, you know, that, that would be the uh, <clears throat> the equivalent of, uh, of uh, intuition, but except on a group mm -hmm. level, right? So. But if you have a, um, if you have a system where um, there are people with different levels of experience that may the, the majority rule may not be the best thing to do. Okay. And the but listening to everyone may be a good thing. For instance, the uh, aviation industry teaches pilots the following rule. First, listen, then speak. Mm. It's a rule for the for the um, superior. And so in a, in, a, in a situation of difficulty, hmm, 
not speak what you think is right, but first listen to the other. And then make the decision. So it is no majority rule, but it also conveys respect for the others. And it allows them to express something. And it also prevents the uh, more experienced person or the person up in the hierarchy uh, not to influence the other ones. Mm -hmm. And so there is a quite number of interesting heuristics that create the entire climate of a company, mm -hmm. like respect, mm -hmm. being taken seriously, being listened to. Yeah. And you can do it the other way around. And here is that's a kind of a mix of it in art and science that one has to follow up. Mm -hmm. I would just need more people who do this rather than saying maximize your expected utility theory or teaching all kind of biases which are if you look closer no biases right exactly so so you uh, you you hear people out and you take in all the the whatever angle they may have on the situation uh, so, so going by heuristics is not an excuse not to do your homework right not to seek out different different differences in in uh, or different views or anything like that you, you're still supposed to Evaluate the facts, right, and and uh, gather up uh, yeah. different viewpoints. So, so there is no contradiction there either, right, between using heuristics and and. No, it's much more difficult. Yeah, you have to invest more work. You have to go into the place. You have to have expert knowledge, mm -hmm. as it said, in the instinct that uh, decision theory. There is no knowledge necessary because the assumption is you know already all options. And then you just calculate. Right. Yeah, but 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 let's say there's a decision situation where you know we're looking again an investment of some sort, and and there's plenty of financial value here. We all agree, and and we basically want to go ahead. But then there's this contingency, a risk scenario that could be disastrous, and there's some probability of that happening. Um, What's to do? What's to be done here? Aren't you supposed to size up this possibility and try to quantify it somewhat? Like, is the investment still worth it, even though we have this yeah. contingency uh, potential disaster? Quantify it somehow. Yes, it is not an opposition. Once again, hmm? mm -hmm. it is. Uh, to, when we study heuristics, we do research. Hmm? We start with the experts. We start with analyzing. They can err. You need tons of data, but not the illusion that you, uh, that uncertainty allows you to determine the optimal solution. And also not the illusion that complex models are always better. Take your example about finance. I work with the Bank of England in order to uh, change the current uh, complex models like value at risk models in uh, so there's the Basel one two three regulations and three has uh, so in order um, if you are a big bank you have to estimate thousands of risk factors and they correlate so you have a correlation matrix in the orders of millions that's the model fight complexity with complexity what you get is an illusion of certainty. Nobody can estimate all these correlations. And that leads leeway for the banks to change the estimates in order to us that the, uh, the value at risk is looks much more better and they need less capital mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah? So uh, that's the complex way. It's a world of uncertainty. It has never worked. It's just done because some people believe that you need to fight fire with fire, complexity with complexity. If you would have a stable world in your uh, era of finance, then do this, make it complex, but not. So we use, uh, so we test uh, together with the Bank of England, with Andy Holdren, who is the, the chief economist, uh, a simple fast and frugal trace, hmm, which just look at uh, key variables, hmm, like leverage ratio and weighted leverage ratio and uh, other things you can uh, uh, you can find this in uh, my publications and and then uh, empirically find out huh, 
was they predict mm. uh, banks in troubles better or worse than the complex models. And if you know a little bit statistics, then you can already guess hmm, that the complex models will immensely overfit and not mm. uh, predict very well. So uh, that's just an illustration that in the world of finance, complex models uh, only look better if you have no real good statistical training and right. don't understand the problem of overfitting. And you need to make it sufficiently simple so that it gets robust. Mm. But I'll give you a very simple illustration uh, that Remember Harry Markowitz, mm. he got his Nobel Prize in economic science for the problem. You have a, a sum of money and you want to allocate it in a number of N assets. How do you distribute it? So he got a Nobel Prize. That's called the mean variance portfolio. When Harry Markowitz um, made his own investments for the time of his retirements, he used his Nobel Prize winning optimization models. So we might think, right. no, he did not. He used a simple heuristic, namely uh, allocate your money equally. So if you have two options, you do 50-50. If three, a third, a third. Mm -hmm. That's a heuristic. Mm -hmm. Where I got the Nobel Prize for, is an optimization method. Uh, studies have now tested how well 1 over n, that's the heuristic, 1 over n, does compare to his Nobel Prize winning method. And most of the time, 1 over n makes more money. Mm -hmm. And it only makes more money because it's uncertainty. If the assumptions of the optimization model would hold, and the world would be stable. Of course, it would be better, but that's not the world we live in. Yeah, so yeah, no, that, that's of course very telling. And and uh, there's any number of examples of model, uh, you know, hubris, overconfidence in model being part of the problem rather than a, a fixed and a problem, right? Where where we act on on this confidence and we get ourselves into trouble. So and this problem is more in the social sciences including economics yeah. and also for instance the mistrust against intuition and intuition is so heuristics that go into your flesh basically you know, or in a heart or wherever you want to or your guts uh, because you you just do it huh? and most of what we do it runs on unconscious use of heuristics huh? wow. so they are uh, the, this type of intuition that one has, uh, an experienced person has, so intuition is, uh, is not an arbitrary decision uh, of a Donald Trump or something that only women have or a sixth sense. It is, uh, uh, as many psychologists have described, it's based on years of experience with a subject. And you feel what you should do or not, but you can't explain it. That's what's being meant. Right. In the natural sciences, uh, uh, scientists who uh, are called intuitive, that's a kind of honor. Mm -hmm. In the social sciences, intuition has been linked to biases, just like heuristic. <laughs> Yeah, that brings us to a very important issue. I mean, uh, as you say, many would argue that, that this opens up for biases of all sorts. Like, uh, for, if you uh, sort of go by your intuition, if it's a, like today, a sunny day, I feel great, uh, I'm, I'm in an optimistic mood, my intuition would tell me something different compared to maybe, uh, you know, last Monday last week when I was feeling deflated. And, and uh, you know, it's the same set of experiences and, and you know, uh, skills and whatever resources I possess, but my mood is very different and, and I would reach different decisions. Uh, so, so I guess, but you have told the, your, your readers uh, that, that not to worry so much about biases. Uh, could you please explain? Yeah, look, 
Um, <clears throat> every heuristic decision making can go wrong. Mm -hmm. There's nothing certain in this life. The question is how often it goes wrong. That's the only question. Every decision made by an optimization model can go wrong. Think about markets. Mm -hmm. Think about the uh, the models I mentioned before, uh, that before the financial crisis of 2008, that suggested that things get better and better and better mm -hmm. shortly before the crisis hit. Huh? So these are optimization models. They're used in the wrong situation, I mean, uncertainty. Yeah. So first, everything can go wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, what's happening is that a group of social scientists link heuristics to biases, but optimization model never. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a reason why optimization models are almost unknown among uh, CEOs. Right. Uh, if you think that Jeff Bezos or uh, uh, <laughs> would sit down and do uh, what, what optimization models, yeah, mm. what machine learning people would do, of course not. Yeah, yeah. because they know they are uncertain that they do something much smarter. So, right. so the entire link between heuristics and biases is a non-starter. Mm. Can do a link between logic and biases. Yeah? Logic thinking leads you to wrong decision. Right. Interesting. OK, so. And not always. The question is always in what situation. If you would think logically, you wouldn't understand very much. So here's an example of a famous so-called bias called framing. Mm -hmm. And uh, Framing is the idea that, uh, oh, I'll give you the example. So you find this example in uh, Thaler and Sunset's book, Nudge. Huh? And they use it to show that people are somehow irrational and they're better mm -hmm. to be nudged to proper behavior. So here's the question. You have a severe uh, heart problem. Huh? And um, uh, there is a, a, a surgery, but it's dangerous. So you ask your doctor, what's the prospect? And now, according to Thaler and Sunstein and others, the doctor could say, you have a 10% chance to die. Or the doctor could say, you have a 90% chance to survive. Mm. According to the heuristics and biases people, you should not listen to what your doctor says, how he says, how he frames it. You know? but it's logically the same. Hmm? But people listen, so they have some bias called framing. Hmm? Now, uh, <clears throat> if you have any sense of intelligence, then you know that your doctor communicates something without saying it. Mm -hmm. If the doctor tells you, if a 10% chance to die, it's a warning. Mm -hmm. Maybe you better stay away. Hmm? If the doctor chooses the other frame, there's a 90% chance that you will win. It's a recommendation and encouragement. Right. Basically saying, I think you should try. Mm -hmm. But often doctors cannot say, I think you should try, particularly not in the US, hmm? mm -hmm. where there are lawyers at every corner waiting hmm, to sue doctors because they have done, uh, recommended something. So all this psychology is not part. And actually, human intelligence here, yeah, mm -hmm. the ability to sense what the other side actually is telling me yeah, mm -hmm. is mistaken as an error. All right. Because logic would be right. With logic, you're not getting very far in the social life. And actually, Craig McKenzie has none has done a number of studies on framing. Mm -hmm. where he had the same situation here, doctors and patients, but had done experiments showing that when doctors knew more, uh, they were choosing more likely, as they knew more that bad things happen, eh? mm -hmm. they were choosing likely the a negative frame. And when they wanted to encourage, they were choosing the positive frame. And also that 
uh, the uh, people on the other side of the communication understood mostly what's going on. All right, so it was an indirect way of conveying the so <laughs> what we, needed to be said but couldn't be said out loud. Yeah, uh, but uh, that's what we do all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, and human intelligence is, as uh, Bruna has uh, said a long time ago, to go beyond the information given, so Jerome Bruna, that's what our intelligence, that's intelligence. Just to have what you have in front of you and do some calculation, that's not intelligence. Mm. Intelligence means to make inferences. And of course they can go wrong, but if you don't make them, you are wrong in the first place. Right, that's that's a good point. And, and uh, it's a very, it's an encouraging uh, message uh, that, that you bring here, that, that we, we have lots of resources and we should mostly trust them. And uh, that's a very different should, message should, from what we're hearing in many of these. Businesses. But the, 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 the idea that uh, abstract uh, rules like those of logic or probability could be a rationality in all situations, that's a real mistake. Yeah. And if you want to more, more about biases uh, and showing that many of these so-called biases aren't biases at all, but signs of human intelligence, I recommend you an article I've published recently. It's called the bias bias mm. in behavioral economics and bias bias is the tendency to spot biases, even if they're not. Mm. Yeah, it's become a very popular sport to to uh, identify these biases and, and sort of sell them. So, but but we in the area of risk, we we, we do have a, a, a blind spot don't, sometimes, don't we? For we we don't see the risk scenario. We we are rooted in our experience. I mean, these uh, these biases, sorry, these heuristics that have evolved, they've done so over eons of times in specific environments, right? And and uh, we're, we function superbly in, in, in those environments, but when it gets very abstract, we, we, we might, you know, not see the risk, you know, we, we prefer not to think about it because it's too complicated and too, so, so we, we, we would rather gamble, we would rather, mm -hmm. so isn't he, isn't there room here for some improvement on, on our innate abilities with some, you know, again, I know you've said it already that, that it's not, either or, but we, 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 there are some blind spots that we should be aware of, right? When, when yeah, of course, of course, and they are often social. So people yeah. say stupid things because they don't dare to deviate from their peers. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and that's to be analyzed, yes. Yeah. And also the entire research on heuristics is at its beginning, mm. because uh, they have been uh, looked down like intuition has been looked down for a long time. We need to have more researchers uh, who, 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 who dare to, to ask, so can we show what the situation is where I can do with one reason mm. better than with all of them? And when it's not the case, yeah? and analyze when is a fast and frugal tree of a certain kind will get better medical diagnosis than a uh, uh, what a, a full tree and such on. Eh? All these questions need to be researched. There's a huge field of research, mm -hmm. but we need to get rid of the idea that there's an opposition between rational and heuristic. Mm -hmm. Right. And rational is always right, mm -hmm. and heuristic is sometimes wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a total non-starter. Mm -hmm. And we need to take uncertainty seriously. Mm. And that is under uncertainty, we cannot optimize. Right. It's just an illusion. Huh? And we need to take heuristic series. We need to study them to understand when they work, how these models can do. And so we know in animal research, for instance, there's a large field you figure out how bees make decisions. It's all yeah. heuristics from the top down to the end. Huh? Yeah. So, like vital dances, hmm? mm -hmm. like just sending out one scout at one level instead of comparing. Why does this work? Huh? Mm -hmm. and, and managers are full with heuristics. Yeah. Like, like if a person is not trustworthy, nothing else counts. Right. 
Is this a good one? Hmm? Kind of one. So we need to dare to ask new questions. Right. Yeah, that's a very uh, nice and encouraging way of, of uh, wrapping up this uh, this uh, session, perhaps to, to this vision of yours that we need to, uh, you know, both heuristics and some analytics to handle uh, handle this uh, uncertain world of ours. But uh, they're not in opposition, and and um, so. Uh, I think that it's been a great uh, conversation with you, uh, Gerd. And, and uh, where can the listener find find more? Uh, do, do you have a web page? Or obviously, your books are great sources yeah, of information. Yeah. Is, there, is there also a web page where they can go and? Uh... Oh yes, I'm, I've I've given tons of talks. You find lots of talks <laughs> on the internet. Um, if you um, want to start with something popular mm -hmm. about the topics we have, uh, my latest book is called how to stay smart in a smart world. Mm -hmm. It's Penguin Press. Uh, uh, another popular book is Risk Savvy. Mm -hmm. That's uh, more channel of the life. And I've also written a book called Gut Feelings. Hmm? Gut feelings Getting yes. intuition out of its niche. Huh? Mm -hmm. and may, and, uh, the, I've studied large corporations and about 50% of all important decisions, important decisions, not measure, are at the end a gut decision. And an emphasis at the end because it's not an either or. Right. So they're looking for data. But not all the data doesn't always tell you exactly what to do. And at the end, you say, I feel it. Based on my experience, we shouldn't do that. All right. so, and scientific books. Uh, we have done a reader, for instance, that's called Heuristics. I'm the first author, Ralph Hedwig and Thorsten Bachur are the other authors. And you find 40 key papers on that. It's Oxford University Press. Mm -hmm. And then there are a number of other books you, you will find on that. Huh? That that sounds great. And, and there's... There's of course plenty of research going uh, going into this and uh, backing this up, but but this has been summarized in some of the books you've mentioned. So those are great great sources of information. Just and read on dare to think and have the courage yeah. to do new research. Yeah, I love that. Dare to think. That's a, a motto I will uh, live by. And and um, yeah. So thank you again, Gad. It's been fantastic. If, if, uh, appreciate so much that you're sharing your, your thoughts and, and uh, wisdom on yeah. this uh, show and uh, hope to see you soon and uh, take care. It was a pleasure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Mm -hmm.